Hello, Broadway family. My name is Charles, and whether you are joining us for the first time or are a longtime member, we are glad you are here. While we can't greet you in person, we would love to connect with you online. You can do that by heading over to our website, broadwaychurchlife.com, or sending us an email to office at broadwaychurchlife.com. As you watch the service from wherever you are, it is my hope and prayer that the Lord may bring rest to your weary soul, that he may fill you with his presence, and that he may be enough for you. May you be reminded of his unending grace and know that Jesus accepts you as you are, requiring nothing more. His forgiveness is available to all who seek him. What good news this is. As you meditate on the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, please enter with us into this time of worship through music. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When 
brokenness and pain is all I know. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my feet doesn't stand a chance when I Hola, Broadway Family Church. Me llamo Ana. As many of you know, we have the opportunity to do a long-distance house build, providing a family in Mexico with a home. Today, I'm excited to introduce everyone to the family that has been chosen for this summer's Broadway 2021 house build. There is the mother, Fabiola, who is 26, and the father, Artemio, who is 27. They have two sons, Josue and Jesus, ages 7 and 9 months old. Currently, the family of four is living in a cuartera, which is really not an ideal environment to raise children in. For those who don't know, a cuartera is a few buildings all near each other with rows of incredibly small living spaces. Just one room for an entire family and the children are typically left to take care of their younger siblings and themselves while the parents work. The area our family is living in has been especially unsafe due to intoxicated neighbors and local traffic through the area exposing the kids to a lot of potential danger, which is why it's such a blessing to be able to move this family into their own home. Hello, Broadway Church family. For those that haven't been on a Mexico missions trip with Broadway in the past, it takes about four days to build a house. 
It requires a foundation, lumber, and plywood to make walls and a roof, windows, a door, just to name a few things. And it requires manpower. A hammer and a circular saw are about all you have to work with. We'll make some shelves and a counter in the kitchen, paint the house inside and out, and furnish the rooms with belongings our family is in need of. It can be tough work with the sun beating down, making it 30 plus degrees, and depending on where the wind blows, you might end the workday covered in dust. Lunch is always looked forward to, and frequent breaks to play soccer and give piggybacks to neighborhood kids are always taken. And if I'm lucky, I can sneak in some snuggles with the dogs and cats, even though I'm not supposed to. Uh, the excitement on Thursday is felt by everyone before the house dedication on Friday, when we get a chance to say blessings to our family and give them keys to their new home. This year, things look a lot different. Everyone has been impacted in one way or another, and it's difficult to feel like a difference can be made in a time like this. One Life, One Chance is doing everything they can to keep supporting the local communities in the San Quintin area. And we get to play a role in that. Even though we can't head down to Mexico and help with our own hands and feet, we can help from here by supporting One Life, One Chance's mission of continuing to provide for local ministries and our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need of Jesus' grace. Broadway, we thank you so much for your continued support and we can't wait to see you at the fiesta. Hello, if we hadn't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Audra and it's my pleasure to join with you today. I want to start by reading a passage from Deuteronomy 8, 2 to 4 and 11 to 18. Essentially, this is an excerpt from a pep talk Moses is giving the Israelites before they cross over the Jordan and enter into the promised land. He says, remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. And then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out and your feet did not swell these 40 years. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands, the ordinances and statutes that I'm giving you today. When you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in and your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold multiply and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint-like rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to humble you and test you so that in the end, he might cause you to prosper. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your fathers as it is today. This passage spoke a lot to me this week. Honestly, sometimes I am such an Israelite, prone to forget, prone to complain, prone to place my identity in things I do, prone to pride. I check all the boxes especially in COVID and with uncertainty about the future when I want so badly to ensure my plans unfold in schedule. Here, I am reminded that God is on this journey with me. Not in the cloud of smoke and pillar of fire he was to the Israelites, but even better, his spirit dwells in me and is exposing the character of my heart and my dependence on Christ. God repeats the call to remember numerous times throughout Deuteronomy. And it's a call that is still relevant today. We get the benefit of seeing what happens next for the Israelites. But even when I'm stuck in the waiting, fighting a battle, or celebrating a victory, God is calling me to remember. Remember that he is a trustworthy God. Remember that he is a God who has shown himself faithful. Remember how he redeems these times in wilderness for my good and his glory. And remember that it is his strength, not my own, that empowers me to persevere 
So I invite you, along with myself, to remember today. Remember God's provision. Remember God's faithfulness. Remember God's kindness. Remember God's majesty. And rest, knowing that you can trust in our sovereign God because it is his nature to be trustworthy. In response, I want to mix it up a bit um, and lead us in a communal prayer. The words will be on the screen. I will say the leader and the all parts so there isn't any awkward silence in between. But I invite you to say the all part aloud as we sometimes need to preach the truth to ourselves and orally remind our distracted hearts of God's goodness. Join with me as we worship in prayer. God of love, it is your will that we would love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. But we confess that our affections continually turn away from you. We turn from gratitude to greed, from freedom to slavery, from remembrance to amnesia, from fullness to emptiness. Forgive us, we pray. All together. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Order our lives by your holy word and draw us to remembrance of your faithful love. Conform us to the image of your loving Son, that we may shine your glory to the world by the way we love one another. Now hear the good news. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, 11 and 12. It's great to be here again this morning, April 25th. Today, we're looking at our third encounter with Jesus. Uh, the first one was the rich young man or the rich young ruler. And last week was this lady is not for stoning. And today we're looking at the conversation that Nicodemus begins with Jesus. So we're going to be reading John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. When Christians discuss the new birth, or this idea of being born from above or being born again, there can be some confusion. Some insist there must be a built-up, painful moment of decision, and then relief and joy and forgiveness, and an overwhelming experience of love. This can be true. The more than 5,000 people that were added to the number of Christians can most likely say that on that day, the day of Pentecost, they were born from above. They can put a date to it and an experience to it. The Apostle Paul certainly knows the day he was born from above. But we need to see that it's always a process at any age, some shorter, some longer. 
can be a matter of minutes for some to enter into the kingdom or a matter of many moments or even months and years as people process through it. I think of Paul when he was defending himself to the governor Portius Festus and King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. I just love the name Festus. He was one of my all-time TV characters. Of, he was the deputy of the great Marshal Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke. Anyways, so Paul's here before Festus and Agrippa. In verse 12, he's, Paul says, I was on the road on my way to Damascus to persecute some followers of the way. This was another name for Christians in this period of time. And Paul says, and about noon, I heard a voice from heaven. Paul goes on further to describe his, his experience. And in verse 24, Festus interrupts Paul and says, you are out of your mind. Your great learning, all your religious and cultural education is driving you insane. Paul continues, I am not insane. The king, Agrippa, knows all about this. None of these facts I've been sharing has escaped his notice. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long time. I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And Paul had been in prison now for over two years. So the important matter is, are you on your way into the kingdom? Are you there? Are you arriving? When Jesus talks to Nicodemus about the new birth, and this is the first conversation encounter Jesus has in, in this gospel, we should not suppose that it means that we should all spend most of our time thinking about that actual moment of our own spiritual birth. When you're growing up in the church, it can be difficult to nail a day. It matters that it happens, of course, but it's not always a quick delivery, so to speak, spiritually, long time or short time. It matters that it happens. The Judaism of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, had as a focal point the importance of being born into the family of Abraham to be a descendant of Abraham. We see this in John chapter 8. And to be a child of God is not a birthright. This is what Jesus is saying. The Pharisee said, we are Abraham's descendants. Abraham is our father. So we're in, we are automatically in the kingdom of God. It is our birthright. And Jesus challenges this. It's not true. And he says to them, actually, you know who your father is? The devil. And he was a murderer from the beginning. And you want to carry out the devil's desires of murder. He knew they wanted to murder him. You are on your way when you realize it's not an earthly birthright. That's what Paul's, that's what Jesus is getting at. It's a birth from above. It's a second birth. The first birth gives you physical birth. And the second birth from above, from God, the Holy Spirit, is the spiritual birth required to enter and see the kingdom of God. It is humbling for Nicodemus to be taught all of this. He is a respected and senior Jewish teacher. He is in process. And we're going to hear from him later at the end. So in this evening encounter with Jesus, what was Nicodemus looking for? Did he have an emptiness, a hunger in his soul for a relationship, a deeper relationship with God? He rightfully acknowledges that Jesus is not your normal run-of-the-mill teacher that has come into town. Nicodemus says miracles are not the norm, and Jesus is performing miracles. And his conclusion is that God must be with Jesus. God is for him. Jesus is on God's team. If Jesus arrived on the scene today, we would take notice that he's not like many teachers as well. He doesn't ask for seed money to help you and promise a $1,000 return on your $100 investment. He just does what is right, and he performed miracles. Nicodemus noticed this. Notice this. We read a few times about Jesus that he was different. It says he was full of grace and truth, not like the teachers of the law. He was not like the other teachers. He spoke with authority. He spoke as if he were actually the Lord of the Jewish scriptures, which he was, which he is. He was meek and gracious and powerful and compassionate and zealous for the things of God. Nicodemus was perhaps looking for some change in his life, or certainly some answers to the identity of Jesus. Coming by night showed a desire for privacy, or maybe a fear of criticism from his fellow Pharisees at this point. Jesus is thrilled to meet with a sincere seeker and answer questions, and challenge assumptions, 
and give correction, which he does here more than once. This is an encouragement to all of us who are truth seekers to come in quiet and serious way to Jesus for a conversation. We need to do this today. Nicodemus is on his way. That Nicodemus even approaches Jesus is a sign of truth seeking. Other Pharisees didn't. He does not approach to rebuke or challenge like the Pharisees, but to talk. So the first thing we see here is a belief statement from Nicodemus. Jesus, you must be from God, because what you are doing is so rare and miraculous that there is no other explanation. You must be a man commissioned by God, a spokesman for, for God. You are a teacher. That's not a bad place to begin, but it cannot end there. He's so much more than a teacher, and Nicodemus will learn this. The person of Jesus makes all the difference, and Jesus will gently teach and correct Nicodemus as this conversation progresses, as he begins to understand the kingdom of God. What is your belief statement of Jesus at the present time? Special speaker, smart, educated, a guru like others? Jesus needs to correct us on who he is. He is the living God. Number two, Jesus says this, we must be born again, chapter 3, verse 3. We must be born again to see or to enter the kingdom of God. This is not where Nicodemus thought the conversation would go. Jesus does not say, well, yeah, you're correct. Thank you for your compliment. Jesus gets right to the crux of the matter. Jesus knows his and he knows our deepest needs and our spiritual possibilities, and he gets right to it. Nicodemus comes to him, and, he, and Jesus takes Nicodemus to where Nicodemus needs to go, not where he thought he needed to go. Jesus knows where Nicodemus needs to go. Nicodemus assumed that he had the kingdom of God idea all figured out, and perhaps he was looking for a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with Jesus. Jesus presupposes the greatest need Nicodemus has and takes him in that direction. He moves him into the kingdom of God. The direction he is taken by the great shepherd is to see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes to what he knows is the highest human aspiration, or at least it should be. That's the kingdom of God. The universal human longing for, human longing for a great life is coming to the forefront. And Jesus tells us that to see the kingdom of God is where it's at. We need the kingdom of God as it holds the deep answers of the searching soul. Anyone who wants to see the kingdom of God must first undergo the most radical change imaginable and experience a completely new beginning. It can't be from our own inner resources. The answer is not inside us. It is outside of us, from above. Everyone, without exception, needs a new birth in order to see or enter God's kingdom. No human being qualifies to enter on their own merit. They need another birth. The first birth, the earthly birth, does not qualify you. You need another birth, a different kind of birth, a birth from above, a spiritual birth. The verb here is an action word, and it's to be born. Action, brought to birth. It's a word used to describe the action of a full human being coming into existence. This is radical. A whole new unique birth is necessary to see the kingdom of God. You don't inherit it from your parents. He does not say to take one more spiritual step of obedience or give a list of to-dos or holy sacraments or church attendance or giving more money to the local synagogue. Jesus doesn't thank Nicodemus for coming to him for his nice praise and compliments. He tells him, and any one of us who's listening, that only the most radical change imaginable enables anyone ever to see enter the kingdom of God. It is not about what you must do or not do, but is totally concerned about what you must become, a follower of Jesus. It is not an amended life or an improved first life, earthly life, flesh, but it's a new one, a life of spirit. It's not an improvement on the person, but a new origin, a new creation. It's something you can't give yourself. The Holy Spirit must give it. It's a spiritual birth. The human question and the divine answer lie at two different and separate levels. The answer to the earthly qu human question is not found on earth. It's found above. Number three, we have a seeking question here from Nicodemus. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus is thinking, I want to go forward, not backward, and start all over again. 
I need another physical birth to figure things out? Back into the womb and start all over? I am a Pharisee. I am advanced. I need to start over. Might be what he's thinking. Nicodemus is fixed on what human beings can and cannot do or have done to them by themselves. No one could. He cannot. He is singularly focused on human possibilities being achieved by the human himself. There's no thoughtful connection to the living God in producing this. Nicodemus is the classic rationalist. Only what is humanly reasonable can be true. If we keep our focus on human possibilities and abilities, then what Jesus says is impossible. Nicodemus starts out kind of believing, but now says, well, this is impossible to go back into my mother's womb. He's just thinking earthly. Number four, Jesus says, we, you, must be born again. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. You must be born of water and the Spirit. Jesus is describing one event here, not two events. It is a birth that involves water and the Spirit. The uniting of water and the Spirit is shown in other parts of the New Testament. Water is symbolic of the Spirit, and it symbolizes washing, cleansing, and renewal. This is part of the birth, becoming new. When Nicodemus heard this, he would have thought of water baptism or the ritual cleansing that is part of the Jewish traditions. The Jewish purification washing ceremonies are inadequate. Jesus says you need a washing that is from above into the heart. This earthly water does not really clean the heart because out of the heart come unclean things, not what go into the stomach. And so it has to be a cleansing of the heart from the spirit, not something on the surface. But in this case, it is not literal water, but the spirit who does this. Titus 3, 4 to 6 says, God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's the washing of the Holy Spirit, the water of washing. We are humans because of the first birth, and we become people who enter the kingdom of God because of a second birth, the birth that has its origins in heaven with the Spirit. He said, flesh generates flesh. What has been born of the human family is part of the human family. What is human cannot give us access to the kingdom. Spirit generates spirit. What has been born of the spirit is part now of the family of God. You should not be surprised, he says to Nicodemus, that I say this. It is absolutely necessary to be born all over again, unless, cannot. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus is real here. He's telling us, he's telling Nicodemus that we cannot see or enter the kingdom of God without him. No one can see unless. No one can enter unless. You must. This probably was offensive to Nicodemus, as it is to many people today. Nicodemus believed he already had been born the proper way to see the kingdom of God. He had the right heritage. He was the people of God. He was Israel. He was a Pharisee in God's kingdom, he thought. He thought he already was in the kingdom. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You are not. You cannot unless you must. Having flesh from Abraham is not it. You need an additional birth. And this time it is gener generated from the spirit from above. Being members of the synagogue or church is not the qualification for entering the kingdom. You people of God, Israel, must be born again to become the true people of God. Your present religion, however holy you may think it is, will not give you the required entrance into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, and for all of us, that's what Jesus is saying. You need faith in me to be spirit baptized, spirit washed, spirit born into this new community, the church, the kingdom of God. He is telling the people of God that they are not the people of God. They must commit themselves to him, be born and enter in to the kingdom of God. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. The initiative and power for spiritual life comes from God. 
Only spiritual life birthed from above will work. He said this to the Samaritan woman as well. He says, I give you water to drink. You cannot give it to yourself. I imagine a bit of a surprised look on Nicodemus' face. How is this possible? This is his question. Jesus continues anticipating the question of how, what, what must I do for this to happen? Is it up to me? How do I do this? Jesus says, the spirit, it's like the wind. The spirit's work cannot be planned. It can't be humanly organized and regulated. It is mysterious, but it's also obvious at the same time. This verse warns us against any attempt to command his presence or his work. These verses resist spiritual techniques that promise His presence or power. We trust the work of the Spirit as His Word is preached. The Spirit does not come from within us on our own personal depths. The Spirit comes down into our hearts in His own sovereign freedom. That's what Jesus is getting at, describing it like the wind. The new birth is sheer divine gift. As Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, if you only knew who I was and the free gift of God I can give you, this is who Jesus is. Number five, seeking question number two from Nicodemus. How can this be? How can this, how can this work? Again, we see Nicodemus measuring reality by what he thinks is humanly possible. It seems that Jesus just answered the question, but Nicodemus still not understand. You know, it's okay if we're slow to understand. God is patient. Nicodemus is a believer who is struggling. He's coming in. He's wanting to know more. So Jesus moves on to help with his questions. It's like Nicodemus says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Nicodemus is thinking, I thought this midnight conversation would be easily understandable and this seeking thing would be simple. But Jesus says to him, in verses 10 to 15, Nicodemus, you need to know your books. You're a teacher of the scriptures. You should know this. Are you the only teacher in Israel who has never taught about the miracle in the valley of dry bones? How can you not understand what I'm talking about with the spirit and new things? Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14 says this, I will put my spirit in you. Come on, Nicodemus, know that. Ezekiel 11, 19, 36, 25, I will put a new spirit in them. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. This is Jesus defining Ezekiel. Renewal is one of the main themes of Israel's prophets. Nicodemus, come on, how could you miss it? It's in there. You're a teacher of this. Yes, I am a teacher from God. And these miraculous things can happen. New birth can happen. There is a living God in heaven, and he is good at renewing things and people. That's what Ezekiel says. He brings life to dry bones. This is all very humbling for Nicodemus. He thought he had things tidied up, labeled, sorted into neat piles. Jesus was messing things up. Nicodemus is a respected and senior teacher, and he's getting schooled, so to speak, on the scriptures that he claims to be an expert in. I just want to read verses 12 to 14 for this next section. Jesus says, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is what Jesus is saying. I'm from heaven. I tell you the truth again. I'm more than a teacher with heavenly ideas, but a teacher from heaven. Literally, the place of origin for Jesus is heaven. He's not just from God, but he's God himself. No one else with direct access to God but him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one has ever gone up into heaven except me. That's a prophetic past tense as we know now that he went up to heaven after this in the ascension. It's the incarnation. Jesus came. He was the word become flesh. And then he's stating here, I'm going to go back to heaven. And this will be the last great historical act of Jesus of Nazareth. And we read about it in Acts, ascending into heaven. But we do know he's coming back to take us. Jesus is saying, I'm not just a spokesman for God. I'm not just a teacher or a prophet. I have been in heaven. I existed from long ago. We will learn later on in John chapter 8 especially. He said, I'm actually from heaven. You should take me seriously. Jesus is the exclusive personal bridge between heaven and earth, between God and human beings. If anyone wants to do business with God, he can only do it through Jesus. 
Do we want clear knowledge of God to listen to? Then we need to listen to Jesus. Do we want to go to God like Nicodemus? Follow Jesus. He is the only one who has been there and who knows the way. Let's not try to get there by ourselves or by someone else's instructions. Do not expect any other heavenly visitations. Do not look for more. This is the claim of this short text. Jesus is it. He said, I must be lifted up. That's from Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. And it was during the wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites grumbled and were punished with poisonous stakes that invaded the camps and killed many of them. God gave Moses a remedy. Make a serpent out of bronze, put it on a pole, and hold it up for people to look at. Anyone who looked at the pole would live. This symbol today remains a sign of healing used by various medical organizations. This clearly, this text clearly points to the cross of Jesus. Humankind has been invaded with a deadly disease called sin, and the only cure is to look at Jesus on the cross and find life in him. Paul said it this way, Jesus knew no sin, and he became sin for us. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the cross. It was not a, an accident. It was destined for this to happen. And we must have faith in the crucified Messiah. Jesus is literally lifted up on the cross. And this is what he's talking about. We look and trust as we see that the cross is the ultimate ladder set up between earth and heaven. And Jesus says, believe, believe. Verse 315, everyone who believes may have eternal life. In John 1.12, we read this, those who believed, it's a present continuous ongoing sense. In John 3.16, it's a present ongoing tense, not a past tense. Whoever believes keeps on believing. We can't just be believed-ers, past tense. We keep on believing. So whatever happened to Nicodemus, did he stick it out? Did he continue to go after Jesus? Did he continue finding out more about the kingdom of God? Did he stay thirsty and eventually find Jesus as the source of all that he needs to quench this spiritual thirst as we see in this here? Let's, let's look into the scriptures. John 7, verse 50. We see Nicodemus numbered among the Pharisees, but now he's defending Jesus and trying to persuade his fellow Pharisees that Jesus deserves a hearing before being condemned. The Pharisees are breathing condemnation, even hatred and disdain for Jesus, but not Nicodemus. He's defending Jesus. And then later in John chapter 19, verse 39, Jesus has been crucified. Joseph of Arimathea has asked for the body of Jesus, and he was accompanied by Nicodemus. Nicodemus brought all the appropriate burial spices and materials for a proper burial of Jesus. 75 pounds worth. They took the body, the two of them, wrapped the body of Jesus with the spices in strips of linen in accordance to Jewish burial customs. While other Pharisees wanted him crucified and would never in a hundred years touch the body of a dead heretic in their minds, but here's Nicodemus showing respect, dignity, love, compassion, and care to his Lord Jesus. He is now the Savior. We need to graduate from seeing Jesus as just being a teacher to being a Savior like Nicodemus. Are you thirsty? Is there a need in your soul for eternal answers? In the case of Nicodemus, it looks like it was a journey of two, three years. Much sought. Certainly a slower, slower response compared to other responses we read. Again, long time or short time, the process, but enter. It could be a huge tumultuous event with a dramatic buildup of painful moment of decision and tidal waves of relief, exhilaration, forgiveness, and joy. That might be your testimony, but it's also a process. You grow up in this and you enter into the kingdom of God. What matters is that your life, my life, show evidence of this new birth, this new life, of spiritual health and inner strength and purpose to follow Jesus. This is what Nicodemus did. We read that at the end of John. Jesus says, come follow me. Enter into the kingdom of God. Enter into kingdom life.
a new, whole new way of living. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You will have a light. Come, join Nicodemus in this experience of kingdom life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and have it to the full. It's in John 10, 10. We're living in tumultuous times. Just, again, I've said this before, pick up the local progress. There's horrible stories. You know, of uh, murder-suicide here in Chilliwack and drug addictions and opiate deaths. And, and, and in the States, you know, we've just gone, they just, they've just gone through in Minnesota this trial and, and justice prevailed on that uh, trial in Minnesota. But there's so many uh, issues in our world. And what do we do with them? What can, what can we do? And I think Jesus comes in here, he says, let's start with the basic thing. Hearts need to be changed. I think Jesus would say, unless a person is born again, they can't enter the kingdom of God. And so we need to get this message out. We do need to fight, in, not in a literal sense, but we, we do need to fight for justice and be concerned with all the difficult things going on in our, in our city, in our country, around the world. But Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus, be born again. Receive this spiritual life. That's what we all need. That's what we need. And so as I've been talking about these encounters, these discussions with Jesus, you know, one of these weeks, might not be next week, I want to talk about our own personal discussions we need to have with Jesus. There's times when we need to meet him at midnight and, and have some big questions. You know, Lord, what does this mean? How does this work? So we're going to get into some of our, you know, cultural questions of how God works in our time during COVID, especially. You know, what, how do we keep going? How do we be patient? How do we, how do we pray for our government and, and love people and have the mind of Christ in all this? So have a good week, Broadway. Amen.
shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus We hope you've encountered Jesus today, Broadway, through music, prayer, or word. And we pray that you may continue to encounter Jesus in your week. We love you and we miss you. Go in grace and peace, Broadway Church.